Canvas, go to that link that's on Canvas, and they'll redirect you to where you put in the address. Okay. Check the I'll stop by there uh, after class and see what we could do for, uh, I'll figure it out. I'll send you something on the campus. Now the syllabus, anyone get a chance to take a look at the syllabus? All right, so we'll have a few assignments, uh, which will be 20% of your grade. Those will be due on that Sunday. So whenever I post an assignment, we do that following Sunday, okay? Uh, by midnight, that's what I'll say. Chapter discussions. So pretty much for each chapter or lecture, for each week, we'll have a discussion, and everyone should post at least once about the topic, the subject, kind of give some sort of personal viewpoint on it, right? Kind of know it's your own uh, use of words. Uh, towards the end, we'll have a group presentation. I'll put everyone into groups. I'll pick different topics about psychology where I may let you choose your own, if you will. And uh, that will constitute 10% um, of your grade. And we also have our exams, which are 60%, right? so we'll have uh, four exams, right? The four exams are really, they'll probably cover maybe I'd say about three channels. Uh, they won't be long and exhaustive, but they'll be interesting, so you'll need to study. And that is pretty much it. Anything extra, I expect everyone to be in class, unless you're excused or shoot me an email, something's going on, if you're sick, or you're an emergency, or something with athletics or sports. Uh, but for the most part, I expect that you want to be here and participate in our discussion. All right, let's get back to it. Okay. So we left off kind of talking about what psychology is, where it comes from. Um, we'll continue on with that. All right, so who here has never taken a psychology course again? Okay, so we got a few. So let's do this too. Let's come get our uh, And I'm going to kind of use that to track attendance as well too. study of mental life, or we could most likely define the study of mental processes and how it manifests on the day. Right? Two different ways. One, you have mental life, your experience out that's shaped by things on the outside, and shaped by things internal. And one, how does it all work? Right? So we want to understand the mechanics behind how it all takes place. Um, we'll get to that once we get to sort of the anatomy of the brain but here we're trying to answer big questions. Nature versus nurture. Who here believes that mostly who you 
R now is because of genetics. Who here believes that who you are now is mostly because of your experience in life? And I say mostly, so you're kind of leaning more towards experience than just pure genetics. Okay, what do you say? So think of this philosophical idea. Either you're telling me that you started off with a blank canvas when you were born, and the world and your experience and your environment is painting everything day by day, whatever your, your talk, your touch, your sense. Or maybe you're not started off with a blank canvas. Maybe that's just your perception. Like, yeah, I'm learning stuff. Think about it. How do we really learn? How do we really understand anything? You're like, well, maybe I already understood it. Maybe I already knew this. Maybe nothing is an understanding. Rather, maybe the genetics in you allow you to think you understand. Maybe it's just memory. Right? So these are big ideas. That psychologists thought about, like, well, where does it come from? With this blank canvas theory, right? We, we get all this stuff out in the world and it finally makes us and shapes us who we are. Or do we already have predisposition when we're born, specific genetics that will make us sensitive to certain things in the environment already? Right? Things you'll pick up and things you won't pick up. Things that'll bother you, things that don't bother you. We really don't know. So what we can say is maybe is a little bit of both, right? Um, you're like, hey, I'm listening to my parents. They teach me my values, what's right and wrong, things I should do, who I should be, what's important, what's success, what's not. And really, they're maybe they're just conditioning you, right? They're selling you something. You bought it, right? You bought it. Why? Because they're your parents. Ultimately, maybe there's a level of trust. Maybe some time later in life, you're like, you know what? You sold me what you wanted to sell. Now, through these experiences, I've kind of realized a lot of the, you know what I wanted, or maybe it was a lot, right? Or you do accept it, naturally. Why you may accept it? Now it goes even further through other fields in psychology like evolutionary psychology. We could say, hey, it's a generational thing. Maybe parts of you is not mom and dad. Maybe it's not even grandpa and grandma. Maybe it's like from a couple thousand years ago. And the ancestors who viewed the world a certain way. And that specific gene carried on as being important according to evolution in order for you to survive. And now you still get it. Right? So now you're lost. You're kind of like, nobody even remembers this gene. So why do I act odd or weird in comparison to other people in my family? Right? Maybe this gene just stuck with me and not other people in my family. Maybe it's scary. Right? So we have all sorts of thoughts, hypotheses, right? concepts and theories about psychology. But something to think about. right? So the whole nature versus nurture debate. That is big, it's still going on, no one knows, right? So either do we have psychological characteristics that are biological in origin, our genes, hereditary, or we develop our ability through experiences, right? You finally, finally become you, more like who you think you're supposed to be, or rather what you should be doing through interacting with your senses, right? What you see with your eyes, what you feel with your ears. So that's where we are. Okay, Locke, all right? John Locke was a British philosopher, early 16th century. He proposed that ideas originate in world perceptions brought to mind from the senses, right? So he was more so nurtured, right? Things develop through your senses, and that's when it comes to your mind. He suggested uh, blank 
translate it first. Kant, Immanuel Kant, another big philosopher, proposed something different. He says some ideas, some ideas are at birth. Now as we get to like childhood development, we'll say, hey, when a baby is born, it automatically knows how to suffer, right? It needs nutrition, so it automatically knows how to go to his mother's breast, attach his mouth to her, and begin to suck. You're like, well, that's a skill, right? How do you know how to do that? Right? Who gave the baby that instruction, right? So we can examine with real world observation that, hey, some things are at birth, right? Baby cries. Cries for what? Because it's not getting what it wants. It starts to notice if it cries, people react to the cry and gives it what it wants, right? So maybe it'll start to cry more often or manipulate its own cry. You that's pretty interesting. The baby's going to manipulate its cry if it wants what it wants when it wants it. Else people will respond, right? You kind of tell the baby to shut up in some way. So we know that there are observable traits, the things that predefine it, that are innate, right? So some ideas are um, from birth. I'm moving in the modern era. So think of the psychology as a field that's not old. Right? We talk about mental health, mental health mental health, right? Quality of life. This wasn't like talked about. This was not a field 200 years ago, right? This is like not a real thing. It's just like people just live, had a couple of real philosophical ideas about why we're here, metaphysics. But no one really studied it, like in the laboratory, from a scientific point of view, right? Asking good questions, get good data, collect the data, try to assess the data, and finally come up with a decent conclusion about why we behave the way we do. Right? That's relatively new. So it started with this guy, Wundt, right? Wundt was a German, uh, he's called sort of a German, uh, I believe a sociologist at the time. Uh, experimental psychology, he's the father of it, right? He came out with this book, Principle of Physiological Psychology, and he standardized procedures. So he sort of made these questions about uh, our behavior more scientific, right? Things we can measure in a controlled environment. He therefore um, trained students from Europe and the United States. So we say psychological, really, psychology as a field is a Western sort of idea, right? The Far East, you can get from Asia, the Philippines, China, Japan, there's just a little bit of difference, right? They didn't define human psyche the way that we do. And there's other things, a collective things like religious beliefs, intuition, and all sorts of things. All right, so we get James, and he kind of talks about the same stuff, let's get him. Um, so psychology kind of grows, look at this. First, 1889, first international psychology convention to limited international attendance. So I think there's almost 1900. People are trying to talk about this proposed field. Very few people show up. Uh, whatever. That sounds like a bunch of mumbo jumbo, right? Like, wow. So, for thousands of years, we didn't even think of our minds as like some sort of mechanisms that make us do what we want to do. And then in 1972, here in the United States, um, first International Congress of Psychology held outside of Europe. Like, that's not long. Right. Okay, get into some schools of thought, right? Structuralism, right? Focus on complex mental experiences made up of simple elementary components of the mind. Basically, if we're looking at the brain, say what are the structures of the brain and what are some of the major things that come from the structures, right? Okay, people have emotions, okay, so emotions and feelings, right, are things. People have perception. Now, what is perception? How would you define yourself? Yes? How we view and internalize things, like experiences and things like that? Yeah, you could say maybe it's a personal viewpoint, right? How you view something. 
everybody look at the same thing. Everybody may view it differently, right? Maybe unique to you, your perception of something. What standouts for my words may stick for one person certain things, other things are like blah blah blah, and other things may stick to that. Now remember. And so functionalism focuses on mental activity of mind as it interacts with body and adapts to environment, right? Which means that, well, we're going to shape ourselves according to the environment. Is it functional? Right? You change your environment, now you might have to change that behavior in order for you to survive. Give me some examples. Example, when you change your environment, Changing your environment will cause you to change your behavior. What's some simple example? Yes. Changing schools or going from high school to college. All right, high school to college. You're like, hey, all right, guess what? From my perception, it seems a little bit more grown up. All right? I feel a little bit more adult. Maybe we're not going to be in clicks. Maybe dressing up is not as important as it used to be. Maybe comforts more important. Hey, you actually want to be on time, right? So the environment has changed, and maybe you change, right? So like you have to adapt to this environment. Who else? So go ahead. Yes. Um, I think um, physically fresh eyes, and we think that this is fresh eyes, and we think that this is fresh eyes, and we think that this is fresh And which kind of we'll get to. What well, that's a humanistic approach. You're like, hey, in my mind I have an ideal self. Self I want to be. I want a Ferrari. And I want to get a condo overlooking the lake. Right? And I want to travel the world and be well liked. And the people I hang with, that's not really their goal. Right? They don't look like they're going anywhere. Let me get rid of them and change my behavior because their behavior doesn't allow it align with mine, right? Doesn't allow align with my view of who I want to be ideally. So it highlights relationship between the mind and body, which means that physiologically, if you change environments, uh, your genetics starts to change. So think of this, your, your genetics are code of information. So inside of you, Billions upon billions of code of information to do different things. Okay, we gotta make sure your heart's still beating, right? Okay, we gotta make sure your toenails are still well. You're not thinking about it. Right? Make sure your eyesight's a little proper. Make sure you're able to digest. And now you change environment. You're like, oh, you know what? Went from cold to hot. Now what? Right? You're like, oh, I gotta perspire more. Maybe my body will change and give me a tan me from all the sunlight, this UV, right? Things will change physiologically. And guess what? Your mind might start to change. You think, oh, when uh, seasonal depression, I'm in Chicago from whatever, November to, let's say, May, to the States, and you're like, hey, I'm depressed. My behavior is a certain way. As soon as it gets back sunny, everybody goes outside and they're the happiest of all time, right? So you're like, wow, environment changed. Therefore, I'm going to change. I changed my behavior. I'm happy. I'm doing stuff. I'm active. I'm motivated. Now it's cold. I'm not motivated. I have no drive, no will. I'm depressed. Things change. You change your environment. On a longer scale, think evolutionary. The world is a pretty big place. So we don't all look alike. Right? Think of that concept. We don't look alike. Where would you think? didn't ask for this look, right? And maybe if you have it your way, you might could say, I want to change my look, right? Nobody asked for that. She didn't ask for your name. You got the name that was given to you. You were forced. And you didn't have a choice, right? But now you got to live with it. You got to accept how you look. You got to accept your name. Maybe you can change it legally. Right? So in reality, you're almost born with an identity. You're born with an identity that was forced on. You're like, well, that's interesting because of people migrated over planet Earth over time. And 
nature says, hey, we need you to look different in order to survive here. You live in the mountains, you might be shorter, right? You live in the mountains for 10,000 years, that generation of people might be shorter people. If you live in the hot, hot desert and uh, with the sun beaming on you for 10,000 years, you might have darker skin to protect you from, right? You might have curlier hair to protect your scalp. All sorts of reasons that na uh, nature says, hey, we need you to be different in this environment. We can't all be the same. Right? So think about that. That has to do a little bit with functionalism. All right, psychoanalysis. Freud, right? Theory of human nature and therapy for treating disorders. Disorder is simply faulty. Right? Cognitive disorders is faulty. When we say cognition is so anything with dealing with a uh, faulty thinking, we would describe as a cognitive disorder. But disorder simply means out of an average. Remember I showed you the bell curve last time, right? Out of an average. You're too far left, you're too far right. Most of the people are doing okay, somewhere in the middle, which means they're able to function in society. Right? Or function in some sort of context. All right, so Freud thought that the mind contains different conflicting parts. And as we go through the physiology, maybe he's right, right? Maybe he's right. In the back of our brain, we would have something called sort of the reptilian brain. Why is it called that? It's pretty much every reptile. And that controls all of your major automatic functions. Heart, voice, all the things that you Right? As we move towards the most center part of our brain, we have the limbic system that controls emotions. So women have a more complex limbic system than men. Right? Ah, interesting. More complex emotional. And hence women are more emotionally intelligent than men. Right? They can pick up on emotions. They already know. Which means they can also manipulate emotions a lot better, <laughs> manipulate emotions a lot better than men. And the last part that came through evolution was the prefrontal cortex. And we have the largest one for the most part. It's densely compacted, and that deals with logic, rationality, problem solving, everything that makes us think. We build skyscrapers and rockets and computers and all of that stuff. Right, so we say there are some things that are competing. Right? Logic is maybe competing with emotions, right? Emotions may be competing with automatic processes. You know, you can have hormone imbalances from those interactions. Right? But Freud <laughs> describes something called a three-part called the id, ego, super ego. Right? And he kind of really took that concept of those three parts of the brain and put them into almost Right? And he says, really, the id is going back to the reptilian parts, the automatic stuff, the stuff that nature says, you automatically need this, no matter what. Your drive to eat, you're going to get hungry, blood sugar level drops, you're like, I'm hungry, my stomach is gurgling, right? Uh, i got to go get some eggs. Um, Sex drive, right? As you mature, you get past puberty, you develop these uh, desires, right? Maybe you don't even control them that well. Right? Nothing to be ashamed about your human being. That's what it's all about. Remember, eight billion human beings. That's the one that's boring. So maybe they're just the truth. I would never do this. Right? So Freud would say, well, okay, that competes uh, as well, too, with what he would call the Let's say, let's jump the super ego and go straight to the ego. The ego, right? The ego is like that final part of knowing itself. It's like, oh, I'm a me, right? I'm me. So special, so unique. I'm an individual unit out here in the world. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna do what I want. Do whatever I want to do. Now, getting back to the middle part would be the super ego, which is basically 
the regulator between the two. So in some simple way, we can put it in a way of you have really an angel and a devil on each shoulder. Devil, angel. In the middle is the suit, because the super is the same. Which, which way do I think? Right? So really a super ego in the middle is uh, to moderate morality, ethics, and make decisions based, based off other factors. Like I can't do what I want to do. I don't know, we got laws. Break law, go to jail, and don't have anything. So maybe I need to switch that up, right? Maybe the ego wants to break the law. The ego wants to do whatever the heck it wants to do. And then maybe the it is like, oh no, I should be promiscuous and just have sex with a million people, because that's the desire as um, a species. And you're like, nah, I probably shouldn't do that. That's not a good idea. Right? All sorts of bad things can happen. So let me kind of curb that idea or curb that desire and regulate myself so that I'm able to proceed in a way that I think is beneficial. So we'll come to that as well too, right? Uh, so yeah, Freud, too speculative, too untestable. Uh, sometimes he's too limited, so people just find him a little too harsh and unaccepted. All right, then we get into behaviorism, which is interesting. Uh, sort of the major psychologist in that field is B.F. Skinner. And behaviorism really says this as a big idea. It says, well, B.F. Skinner believed that he could take any child born and make them a doctor, a lawyer, a criminal, a murderer, rocket scientist, computer engineer, anyone. I'm like, well, how? By simply introducing some benefits or some things to take away from by adding something, right, to stimulate a person to um, to stimulate a person to do something or take away something to make someone do something as well too. Right? So the given sentence. Uh, so think of back to a baby, a child. It's like, all right. Well, let's say a toddler. How do you get a toddler to do something? Right? Introduce something that maybe the toddler may want. Right? Hey, if you clean up your room, I'll give you a sucker. Right? Toddler's like, really? I'll clean up my room. Right? So that's one way to alter behavior and make something, not just human beings, but we'll get to animals as well, too, do something which means we need a motivating factor, a drive. We could say the drive is food, right? And the toddler will do certain things in order to get there. Well, the, on the flip side, you say you could take away something, right? If you, if you don't do your homework, I'll take away your tablet. You're like, I don't want my tablet. Traction of something in order to get someone to do something. Now apply this to adult life. What are some things that can be added or subtracted from your life to make you do something, make human beings react? Anything? Yes. Okay, and what way? My, um, like, you have a lot of people, like, attached to that, so if you take it away, they'll feel like either bored, or they'll feel more like they have nothing to do, or they'll try to make that time into something else. It's kind of like a, because, it's like a because of effect. Yeah, like a cause and effect. Okay. Think of it, if you go on Instagram, you're like, dude, I want to be, uh, on a million Instagram. Instagram knows this. The followers is sort of the drive, right? So Instagram says, in order to get these followers, you're gonna have to do a lot of cool stuff and post it, right? So it's gonna motivate you to alter your behavior. And then you'll start to see like, hey, this doesn't really give me followers what I post. What are, what's trending for the things that I post? 
you can alter your behavior so you can still get the number of followers, right? So social media is a good example. Now, if you stop posting, you might lose some followers, right? And that can alter your behavior as well, too. I don't know, does TikTok has something where you can, um, on the um, apps have it where you can get points or something, or you can get money, or you like interact and do certain things? You can get like, um, like gifts, that's what they call them. Okay. So you can give gifts and stuff, right? Which means you have to have Kind of the same con conclusion here. Um, originally, it started off with dogs, right? And we'll talk about Pavlov. Pavlov was a sociologist and dealt with animals, but he noticed that um, there's a neutral stimulus in terms of the dog essentially uh, like salivating, right? And it smells food of some sort. And then what he did was start to introduce a bell and try to associate the bell with food, right? So eventually the dog does the salivate when he hurt the bell, even though there was no food. So think about that. We could introduce anything and relate it to something else that's a motivation or a driver for something you want. And now when you hear that thing, it makes you react differently, automatically, subconsciously. Uh, so focused on prediction of control of behavior. So think about that. Government can also make you to control your behavior. Parents control your behavior just we said like they do with children. Add something, take away something, make threats, right? To control your behavior, to alter it. Governments do that as well too, right? To take away something. Think about with COVID. Shot, you might lose your job. And they're like, oh gosh, I really like money in my apartment. So, you gosh, alter my behavior and get a shot. Right? So governments can control people's behavior too. It could be done for all sorts of what we we'll call psychological warfare, right? The Nazis use it to, to join an ideology. All sorts of reasons. What time is it? So behaviorism claims that contents of your mind cannot be directly uh, or indirectly observed. Thus, psychology should focus exclusively on study of how environment shapes observable action. Things are set up in a grocery store in a way to make you buy certain items, right? They put the real quick grab and go things, what we call impulse items, buy the register, right? You bought all your groceries. Do you really need a Snickers bar? Do you really need a, a Pepsi, a bottle of that? Do you need some gum? Do you need this little hammer or screwdriver? Right? They already know that you've built up satisfying the craving to shop, knowing that you bought these items that will satisfy something with like hunger or thirst. Thus, you create this stimulus inside of you, maybe some sort of emotional excitement. And by the time you're about to swipe, you buy some extra stuff. Right? So it works. Things could be set up to navigate to make you do certain actions. Um, all right, humanistic psychology, right, which deals with, argues that everyday personal experiences must be main target of psychological study. So that basically means that we, each one of us, have a goal, whether the goal is one we're aware of, conscious, or one that's even subconscious. But in essence, we have an ideal self, something we want to do. You're going to school for what reason? You're going to college for what? Who can tell me why they're in college right now? Like what's your purpose? What's your end goal? Okay, some people say, hey, I'm here for a career, right? Maybe a career means X amount of money. 
the career means a certain quality of life. Like, I don't like my quality of life. I want better, right? I want bigger and better stuff. I want the ability to travel and buy a better car. Or like that. that could be a very personal feeling. You're like, hey, a certain career means a certain social status, right? Call your doctor and then whatever, janitor, whatever. Those are perceptions, right? Of what success is. So one may want a career in order to feel a certain way. Like, I want it so I can feel good about myself, right? Because my ideal self is something I believe to be great. I want to be great, whatever that means. So human psycho uh, humanistic psychology deals with this sort of pyramid, right? So it's developed by, um, the hierarchy is really developed by Rogers and Maslow. But Maslow kind of uh, took this pyramid structure and really form formulated us uh, for us. And basically at the bottom here you got the basic needs, right? Food, shelter, water. Up here you start to maybe start to obtain other things, right? You maybe get some transportation to transfer yourself. After that, then you start to get relationships, a family, a career, a job, education. You get all the stuff. And then you keep going, you say, okay, what's beyond that? Right? What's beyond all the stuff? After you bought the yachts, the Ferraris, and became famous, right? Traveled the globe, all the money. Now what? That's what essentially means. Uh, thinks that you would find some sort of personal, spiritual sort of enlightenment at that point. Which means you could come to a conclusion and say, ah, this all this material stuff is, doesn't cut it. Right? You got it all, but you still may feel an empty void. Right? Maybe like, oh, it's about people. It's about helping people. Maybe. In which case, at the end, he'll call the top self-actualization. Which means, really, you finally come to some internal truth about your existence. Before that, you were sort of um, written a script by others that you followed. Like, this is how it's supposed to be. This is what everybody uh, in history created for me to do. I guess it's important if everybody else does it. This is the process to get to this sort of conclusion, and this is what I'm doing. Eventually, over time, you may come to an actual independent thought, a real thought of your own. And you kind of disregard everything else that you were taught, and you come to your own, say, sort of spirituality. Right? In some sense. So Maslow says that we analyze motivation and motivational needs and focus on human strength. So the motivation is to get food, shelter, water, right, protection. Those are basic. We gotta eat, drink, be able to have shelter, to be secure in a certain neighborhood or what have you. Beyond that, we need things to obtain personal goals. Right? As we get the basics, now we want to get personal goals taken care of. After that, we may start to develop something that may be a more charitable uh, personality and give away the money give away things that you accumulate over the time. But those are the motivations and the motivational needs. And he says that's what we should focus on. Right? Forget all that stuff that Floyd was talking about. We need to focus on what human beings ultimately are motivated by and who they want to be. Any questions so far? Alright. Alright, and we'll end up with positive psychology. Alright? Positive psychology came in the 21st century, paralleling, uh, paralleling early humanistic school of thought. Which essentially, positive psychology says, you know what? All this thought about the human mind and behavior, emotions, et cetera, et cetera, seems really negative, right? Seems like everything Freud talked about was like the really bad parts of humanity, right? 
all the bad stuff in life. And positive psychology argues that excessive attention focuses on human frailties rather than positive individual traits, such as love, courage, and forgiveness. So positive psychology wants to focus on things that are positive. Right? It wants to try to disregard the frailties of human condition, which we, we may think is universal. Like we shouldn't focus on this if everybody's going through all this bad stuff. Right? There's no need to focus on it because we're all going to experience it at some point. How do we change it? We change it by being positive, right? having a mind of positivity. In which case, you may see bad things that happen to you, but positive psychology is like, reason. It's happened to get you to the top of the pyramid, right? If the bad stuff don't happen, you stay at the bottom of the pyramid. That's where positive psychology is. It says it's really there to make you strong, right? A tree out in a harsh environment has a really strong bark on it, right? In order to protect it from the wind, and over time, it gets stronger and stronger, right? Bad climate and weather has to happen to the tree in order for it to get stronger over time, deeper roots, right? Stronger branches and leaves. That's what will be fascinated when it's done. Say, oh my gosh, look at this tree. How did it get like that? Well, it got like that through some harsh things. Right? So too much focus on the negative is not good according to positive psychology. But it may be insufficiently complex to measure many psychological characteristics. All of that to say, psychology is pretty much an open field. You know, you kind of write, chart your pathway. Right now, we're still trying to understand many things. Um, your generation, obviously, I think, has the biggest uh, concern for mental health. Right? It's been talked about the most of them been talked about in history. What do you think are some of the reasons why mental health is so big? modern times, right now today. What are some of the things that you have, possess, or go through that make it so different from the past? Because I feel like people around me. What's that? It's like it's not just affecting one person, it's affecting other people around me by their actions. Okay, so we're saying um, it communicates itself faster now, you're saying maybe? So bad things spread like a virus quicker than ever before. Okay. Yes? Okay. So now we say, hey, we're more mature in how we view it. Now we're viewing it as a real science now, right? Like before, we may view it, view it from a social standpoint. We thought we'd go crazy, put them in asylum, because we didn't understand it, right? We didn't have a way to describe it. We felt the way about it. Right? It made us feel odd and weird. Now, maybe we're more empathetic, right? We can understand people's issues, no matter how bad they are. We can try to be more understanding. <clears throat> All right, cognitive revolution. Uh, time. Time. What's that? 16. Okay. Uh, cognitive revolution involves school of thought that focuses on the mind and information processing system. Basically, cognitive theory kind of says your mind's a computer. The computer you use, model that. Binary systems, zeros and ones, programming, right? The cognitive psychologist means that uh, believe that you have a computer. Just as simple. So if you want to change the software, right, you may have to do some reprogramming. Reprogramming can mean, you know, introducing yourself to some different things. Um, which, uh, to me, is too simplified. That's basically saying if you just switch it up, you could become a different type of person, different type of personality, 
is still a little bit too uh, limited, right? It makes us into computers. I don't know if that's truly a fact for us. But it argues that the mind's ability to acquire, retain, and draw knowledge uh, should be central to psychological science. It's very important, and we'll get to that chapter, on how we absorb or, you know, get knowledge in, how do we keep it, where does it go, some things are stored in long-term memory that are, we need over a long period of time, uh, short things, uh, short-term things stored in uh, short-term memory, maybe like remembering a phone number or something really quick, but they all have their process. Okay, what we have learned, what psychology is and where it comes from, scientific research as a means to answer questions, the three levels of analysis. We don't really go through the levels of analysis, but we will, uh, next class, we talk a little bit more about research methods, what it is to do real research. Um, yeah, and then we'll look at some contemporary psychological science. I will pose maybe a question as a discussion on Canvas for everyone to engage in for this week. Now, any discussion posts should be done by Sunday. Actually, any assignment that needs to be turned in, including discussion posts, is Sunday at midnight. We'll keep it simple. Everybody can Sunday at midnight. Um, I'll stop by the bookstore to see what we can do about access codes and uh, shoot you an announcement on Canvas. But before we go, any other questions? No? Wait, I don't know. Yes? Will you be posting these slides on Canvas? Or? Yeah, I'll post the slides um, maybe week by week. Okay. Right? Maybe at the end of the week I'll post the three days slides. Other questions? All right, have a great day. I will see you on Friday. Friday.